If you've ever taken a drawing class, chances are that your teacher had you do a master copy at one point or another. This is, of course, a great way for getting exposed to beautiful, masterful works of art. And also, there are ways of engaging with those beautiful works of art that will tangibly move your drawing skills forward. And unfortunately, there are also ways of engaging with these master drawings where you're barely moving the needle for yourself. So if you've ever wondered how you could possibly engage with the beauty of a Raphael drawing, let's say, in a way that will move your drawing skills forward instead of merely copying it and not really seeing any results from this copying, you wanna stay tuned because that's exactly what I'll get into in this video. Before we get into it, my name is Carolyn and I've been teaching artists how to master drawing for over 15 years. Currently, the only way I work with artists is in my own online mentoring program called the Legit Artists Bootcamp, where I take dedicated artists who are feeling stuck and like imposters to fully mastering drawing so they can be free to express the kind of creativity that they've always hoped they could express one day. If that's piquing your interest, be sure to look in the description below because I'll put some information for you about that down there. But for now, let's get into this lesson. Let's begin by addressing if master copies are actually a valid exercise for improving your drawing skills. The answer to that is definitely yes, but, and this is a big but, only if you don't just copy them. Now what the hell does that mean? Isn't it called a master copy? Unfortunately, yes, which is why I like to refer to what I'm about to demo as a master drawing analysis, not a copy. A copy would look something like this, often with a grid, and you're trying to make it a finished drawing. A proper analysis looks more like this. It's not a precious drawing. We're not doing it so we can pass it off as our own and frame it later on. These are personal field notes instead, meant for ourselves only. It's similar to taking apart a clock radio, not because you want to prove to anybody that you're a tech whiz, but because you're so curious and you're challenging yourself to learn how this clock radio is put together and how it works. And so the, the trick is that you, we're leading with curiosity. So pick an artist who you're truly curious about and approach it as if you are breaking open the, the drawing to see how it was created from the inside out. This is exactly what I'm doing here. I picked myself a beautiful Raphael drawing, and the first few seconds that you just saw was me testing out what material I need to use to get really close to the look that I'm seeing in his drawing. So I tested out four different pencil types, and I settled in on this Jaconda red chalk pencil by Koei Noor in combination with like a regular drawing paper. And now I am beginning with just the lay-in of the drawing. So I am just getting down the overall height to width, the overall gesture and the overall shapes. And once I have this captured, I'll actually pause and think about a question that I'm approaching this drawing with. Because remember, it's an analysis, it's not just a copy. If I didn't take this pause to come up with some question I'm curious about, I would just end up with a result where I'm copying what I see, but I'm not quite paying attention to how it is that I'm getting the result. For this piece in particular, I was curious about what kind of lines Raphael is using, how he accomplishes his shading, and I was also interested in how he got that hair to look the way he wanted it to look like. So. Now that I have my leading questions going to drive this analysis, I'm also going to re remind myself quickly, well, what kind of lines are there? So there are outer edges and inner edges that often reflect lines in the drawing. And outer edges are basically contour edges. Inner edges are plane changes where one side changes to become the next side, as well as cross contour lines. So I just kind of refreshing my memory here about what it is that I need to seek out. Again, the question is driving the drawing. I'm not just blindly following the drawing. So I'm seeking out areas in the body where I feel like the line work is particularly beautiful. And so here it has taken me to the outer contours along the torso, and I am noticing 
how the lines are overlapping there. Now to truly understand what's happening in this zone, I will have needed to study anatomy. And if you have trouble how to go about studying anatomy, look at that video that I'm putting in the top right corner right now and it'll help you. But for now, let's just keep going with this analysis. I'm clarifying to myself what is going on in the zone. What are the shoulder blades doing and what are the muscles doing? I'm doing this because I don't want to draw like this. Oops, <laughs> I don't want to draw in a spaghetti line because it doesn't tell me anything about the dimensionality of this zone of the body. And Raphael doesn't draw it like this either. Instead, he creates clear overlaps, not spaghetti lines. He understands which anatomical element is in front of the other. So understanding which is a shoulder blade tip and which is a latissimus dorsi shape, which is an abdominal shape, which is a external oblique shape. And if you don't know how to do this stuff, don't be frustrated about this. Take it as the next piece of information as to how to guide your next practice sessions. So if you don't understand what it is you're looking at and why you're seeing these lumps and bumps on the edges of Raphael's um, drawing, schedule some time for some torso anatomy. And like this, the success of this master drawing analysis doesn't hinge on the end result of the drawing, but the success lies in your next understanding of where you have technical weaknesses. And so then that propels your drawing study further in the right direction rather than you repeating the same things over and over again and never seeing any progress. So here's another zone where I don't want to have a spaghetti line for the upper arm into the lower arm. Instead, I will need to understand what muscles are overlapping other muscles in order to get the same look and result in terms of line work that Raphael gets in his drawings. All right, so far I've tackled contour lines in Raphael's style. Next, I'm interested in what other kind of lines I observe. So I'm seeing a lot of distinct line work in the upper shoulder girdle area. So what you're seeing me do here is plot out the rough blobby shapes of the muscles that are present in the zone. Again, I can only do this well if I've studied that anatomy beforehand. So notice how lightly those little lumps are ghosted in because they're then becoming my scaffolding to place the subsequent lines on top of. And we call these kinds of lines cross contour lines, lines that we imagine to go across and over the forms as if it was a little creature, a little microbe going up and down these lumps and bumps, but not in a um, irregular way where they kind of can cross back and forth whichever way they want to, but in a way that's very methodical and organized. So let me break down what it is we're looking at here. I'm gonna enlarge this a little bit more on the side. So here we have this lump that is on the left side of his torso, sitting on top of the rib cage with a bunch of smaller lumps on top. So that is the shoulder blade itself with the muscles that are on top of the shoulder blade. In its simplest structure, it's like this flattened triangular disc that sits on top of the egg like the ribcage egg is here, and then the disc sits on top, like so. So that results in some subtle but important plane changes from the back of the shoulder blade to the inside of the shoulder blade to the back of the torso, back of the shoulder blade to the underside of the shoulder blade to the back of the torso. So these little differences are important because they give us that satisfying detail. Now on top of these plane changes, we can then layer the cross contours if we're following Raphael's lead. So here I'm making marks that lead us around the plane change and over the plane change, marks that shade into one direction of that small inner edge plane 
these are all marks, as I mentioned before, that go across and over the form in an organized way. And like that, they help the viewer understand what the three-dimensional quality is. Now, you don't have to press equally hard for all of these lines. The beauty of a Raphael is that he will press on certain sections of a cross contour harder and then ease off and almost let the line break. And like this, not only does he describe what the muscle is like, but he also lets us understand what the sense of lighting is like, which leads me to my second leading question of the analysis. First question was about what kind of lines is he using? And notice how now that we're looking at these cross contour lines, it's weaving into the answer for the next question, which was, how does he deal with shading? So he uses these across the form lines to give us a sense of which facets of the muscles are being reached by light most directly, which facets of the muscles are not like this here. This entire plane is angled away from the light. And therefore, he is putting more cross contours there. And in the parts like here, he broke that line because there's more lighting there. So, do you see how now I am learning that Raphael is using line both to describe the three-dimensional quality as well as the lighting structure? So in a master analysis drawing, I will often zoom in, draw something much, much bigger just so I can understand fully what is happening. And once I have understood what certain marks are describing and where they're coming from, I can then take that understanding and put it back into the drawing like I'm doing here. So as I got further into this drawing, I wanted to take the next zone as another opportunity to talk about the shading that is noticeable and talk about the logic that Raphael puts behind his shading mark. So I personally don't like the word shading. I think it's a little bit amorphous. So instead, I like to think in terms of light logic and how the underlying form is affected by the light in the direction that the light is coming from. So here I'm trying to figure out what is going on with the pelvis midsection to rib cage zone. How is that organized and how is that affected by the lighting? Notice how on the left I've zoomed in on this region below the arm and kind of moving towards the hip on the right hand side. You see how there is like this darker patch. It's like a irregular dark shape. If you squint your eyes it distinctly stands out. In the drawing part you see me plot out the outer edge of this shape. So I'm not playing with the variations of light and dark within this little value swatch that I see. I'm trying to understand where the shadow begins and ends. Why? Because that describes the underlying form the clearest. So if I box out the pelvis and rib cage. This is the arrangement in its most simplified version that we would see. So the rib cage is tilted back at the top a little bit and then the pelvis is shifted forward and then we have the side plane that isn't being reached by the light. So these two edges here um, are really important because they tell us where the back becomes the side. And this is where the shadow pattern begins. So if we have that edge captured well, then we're going to be on Raphael's heels, letting the viewer understand what the lighting is reaching and what the lighting isn't reaching as much or not at all. So with this understanding, I continue to go through the drawing, asking myself, where are their shadow patterns? 
and where are there opportunities for me to place cross contours that transition out of the shadow patterns into the light or that just describe the volumes within the light mass that we call midtones with those cross contour marks that we have discussed earlier on. Now let's take a look and talk a little bit about how Raphael gets his hair to look like hair. What Raphael understands is that with hair, it's not so much about the texture, but about how it falls across the form of our head. So our head, if you think about it, it's kind of like a half dome or, or an upside down bowl. And over this bowl, there are these sections of hair. So you want to definitely clump your hair and begin the clumps out with very simple shapes. The texture of the hair we can indicate at the edges of these shapes. So anywhere where there's an edge of a shape you'll see me put hair like marks. But what's most important is how the lighting affects that upside down bowl. So here if you look at it as a more faceted um, form you can see which facets will get reached by the light and which ones won't. And these clumps of hair will have to adhere to that light logic. Now just as earlier with the hip zone, the important part is that transition from the shadow into the light. Notice how I put a lot of texture there. So again, anything that's an edge, whether it's the actual edge of a hair shape, like a hair cluster, or whether it is the edge between the top of the head and the side of the head, the back of the head and the side of the head. Any edge is a really great place to indicate the texture of the hair and that then allows you to keep other zones fairly simple. The way to end your master analysis with a positive feeling, even if you're not super excited about the finish of the drawing, is to have an assessment where you just write down a couple of insights that you had as you were going through this analysis. So you have some tangible lessons that you now understand that you didn't before. And in that way, you'll have that positive learning experience. All right, so I'm curious to find out now which artist you're going to look at next to practice this with. So let me know in the comments below which master artist you're going to analyze in your next practice time. If you're resonating with the way I'm presenting information and having you go through these very practical exercises to improve your skill set, I invite you to take a peek at my mentoring program called the Legit Artists Bootcamp that I talked about earlier. This is where I talk one-on-one -on -one with my students, help them set out a practice for themselves that will lead them to their goals and where we can diligently work together to solve your technical problems so you can finally create artwork that you've always dreamed about. I'd be so honored to talk to you about this, so be sure to follow the links in the description. And I'll see you next time.